works. Um, so thank you for coming. Um, and thank you for all of those that are on Zoom online. I uh, will uh, present uh, Dr. Elliot Hort, Brent, and Paz, uh, again at uh, UB and ICCUB. Uh, we'll be sharing uh, uh, us, uh, some, some days here. Uh, and today we'll, uh, we'll, be, we'll, be, we'll be presenting uh, some of uh, its uh, uh, expertise on uh, exoplanet uh, follow-up and high resolution imaging uh, with a uh, speckle technique and others, yeah? and others. Um, uh, Elliot uh, is, is chairman of the uh, physics, uh, physics uh, department at uh, Southern, uh, Southern uh, Connecticut State University. Uh, and, he, uh, and professor of, of physics of, of that department at, uh, at that university for some, some years. And uh, has this uh, dual uh, uh, profile for a long time, uh, both uh, instrumental and uh, science part and on exoplanet and, uh, and high resolution imaging. Uh, I don't think uh, it requires much more introduction. You will see that uh, in the seminar, uh, it speaks by, it by itself. I only will say that if, if you are okay, that we can make the, the questions and answers at the end, if everybody agrees. And yeah, I mean, yeah, let's start. Don's, muchas gracias por convidarme. La Universidad de Barcelona. Em sap greu que no puc donar tota la xerrada en català. So I will now switch to English. But I wanted to at least say a few words at a while before starting. I want to tell you a story in three chapters about ground-based observations that support exoplanet discoveries and uh, exoplanet characterization. So as Octavi said, I've worked for many years in high-resolution imaging. You may know that when people talk about ground-based high-resolution imaging, they often mean one of two things, uh, speckle imaging, which is what I do, and then there's adaptive optics. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about both, but uh, essentially, both of these techniques have played a major role in our ability to characterize exoplanet systems from the ground by uh, determining which of these systems has a stellar companion in addition to a planet or planetary system orbiting the uh, primary star. And so a lot of that work that I've done is with this instrument, which we actually built at my university in Connecticut. Um, but that leads us into the second chapter, which is uh, to talk about a different kind of observing and how that might influence exoplanet characterization in the future. And that is long baseline optical interferometry. Um, and uh, with that technique, uh, I want to talk a little bit about intensity interferometry. That is something you may have studied as a graduate student and never thought of since that point. But there is a revival in intensity interferometry going on right now, and uh, that could bode well for exoplanet characterization. And then finally, in chapter three of my story, I will come back to the beginning and we will talk a little bit more about speckle imaging and prospects for improving that over time. Okay. Chapter one is a little bit of history about what has happened in the last, oh, let's say about 10 years. Um, I'm sure everyone in this room knows about the Kepler satellite mission and its great success in uh, finding exoplanets. Uh, that was then followed up by the K2 mission. 
um, which really specialize in shorter period planets, uh, only because the Kepler K2 mission was uh, a repurposing of that same uh, spacecraft when it was no longer able to point uh, correctly to the Kepler field. So they were able to, I think this is a wonderful physics story. They, uh, the people at NASA were able to use solar radiation pressure to stabilize the, the spacecraft in order that it could point for a period of a month or two in the same field. And in this way, uh, it was uh, used to find a great many more planets, uh, uh, even though it could no longer point in a single direction. Because of the thousands of exoplanets that were discovered by Kepler and K2, and now TESS is added into that, um, there was a great interest starting about 10, 10 years ago in ground-based follow-up observations of these stars that were now known to host exoplanets. And one of the main questions was, how often does such an exoplanet host star also have a stellar companion? And it, the number turns out to be uh, surprising. It turns out to be nearly half of all known exoplanet host stars have a companion within a couple hundred or a couple thousand AU that is physically associated with that system. And so this was a result that was determined through high resolution imaging uh, once these exoplanet host stars were known. Uh, and the, the work that I was involved with regarding that was mainly at the Gemini telescope where we took the instrument I showed you in the first slide called DISI, um, and we did speckle imaging using the eight meter telescope in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. We started doing that in 2012. And that was successful so that Gemini offered this instrument as a visitor instrument that anyone could apply for time until 2018. And we moved the instrument from the Northern hemisphere in Hawaii down to, to the Southern Gemini telescope, which is in Chile and back and forth. And in this way, the instrument that I built got more frequent flyer miles on airlines than I did. <laughs> so the inset picture here shows you, in a nutshell, what speckle imaging is about. A brief reminder, it is a deconvolution technique, in essence. So essentially what you do is you have an instantaneous point spread function that looks very horrible. And if you were to let the atmosphere uh, move and, uh, and boil, then uh, you could build up an integrated image or also known as a seeing limited image, which many astronomers use in, their, in various fields of astronomy. But you can also take these short exposure images and you can uh, perform a deconvolution process which results in an image reconstruction. Uh, and it is possible to get back to the diffraction limit of the telescope, which in the case of Gemini, is about 30 times higher resolution than the seeing limit, even though Mauna Kea is one of the best seeing sites in the world with an average seeing of about six tenths of an arc second. But since we can get to the diffraction limit uh, in the visible uh, with this instrument, we can make images which are have a resolution of about 20 milli arc seconds. And so we did that for hundreds, literally hundreds of Kepler uh, exoplanet host stars and have published many results since uh, 2012 on, on that uh, topic. The reason that high resolution imaging is important for exoplanet characterization is because when you have a high resolution image, you can rule out the presence of a companion star or rule it in uh, at very small separation. So this plot is actually not from Gemini, it's from the Wind Telescope, which is at Kitt Peak, it's a 3.5 meter telescope where we did a lot of test data and we have a lot of, we characterize the system very well there. So we, of the many hundreds of reconstructed images that we can take, uh, this is a representative sample where I plot, if I look at the reconstructed image and I consider every local maximum as a potential star, and I ask what is the magnitude difference from the primary star in the middle of the image, then I can put a point on this plot at that particular separation. 
And I can do that for all of the local maxima in the image and I get a plot like this. If I ask, okay, what is the five sigma limit from all of the points that I see here statistically, it's a function of separation of the primary star, which would be here on the left, then I get a curve that looks like this. This is a very standard curve of limiting magnitude for a companion star for an exoplanet host. And so if we end uh, at a separation of 0.2 arc seconds, we can get about, uh, you can see a, a uh, companion star that it would be about 4.4 magnitudes fainter than the primary star. This plot does not show a companion. If there were a companion, it would be below this curve. And, uh, and so you can also ask of all the stars we've observed at WIN with this instrument, where are the companions that we found? And so that is sort of the inverse of the points that we're looking at. And this is the range of all of the stars that we've detected companions on at WIN. And so you can see that there's a kind of a nice marriage to between these two data sets, they're separated by uh, this detection limit curve. And so we have claimed for years that we can do a very good job of telling you if you have a companion star next to your exoplanet host star. And since we can look at separations which are far below the seeing limit, we can uh, rule out a large amount of parameter space for the presence of stellar companions in these systems. Um, what you would want to do once you have these reconstructed images is you would also want to know, is that second star physically associated with the primary star? Well, there are two things, two tests you might do in that regard. If you could observe in different filters, you could position the primary star and the companion star on the same HR diagram, and you could see whether there's a common isochrome that passes through the two. From that, you might deduce that they are, uh, or at least that would give you some evidence that those two stars are physically related. And there are a couple of big papers from a few years ago that did that, Everett et al. and Hirsch et al. And these are examples of systems that where a companion was detected by uh, our camera. And the primary star, for example, is here. And the secondary star, even given its color, is here. And so uh, you can make a deduction as to whether that is um, consistent with being physically associated. And then this result is similar, but from uh, Kirschenau. That's one way that you can establish physical association. If, you, if they were not physically associated, perhaps the secondary would be up here. Or perhaps it would be down there, indicating that it's at a different distance from uh, the other star in the system. Anyway, uh, HR diagram placement is one way that you can take the information from these reconstructed images and use them to learn about the system that you're studying. Another way, uh, which we were actually talking about a little bit this morning, is that if you can observe the system over a period of years, you can establish whether there is a common proper motion for the two stars. And so in the case that I show you here, which is from this Wittrock paper 2016, we had observed a system for three years or so, and we can definitively establish that they are uh, co-moving stars, therefore probably physically associated. And so if you understand uh, that detail, then you can say, okay, well, uh, that's how we establish the percentage of exoplanet host stars that also have a stellar companion. Usually that stellar companion is at dozens or hundreds of AU away from the primary star. So you have a star and you have a planet or a group of planets very close to this star. And you have a second star that's uh, very far away, say uh, on a scale of our own solar system, a couple of times the distance from the sun to Pluto. Nonetheless, uh, through these kinds of observations, we can establish uh, the percentage of uh, physically associated double stars um, that also host exoplanets. And that's been a major result. This is a, the same kind of detection limit plot, but now for Gemini. 
and it tells you why uh, we were uh, we were able to go to Gemini and use that telescope for six years because we can see very faint companions and we can see them very, very close in to the parent star yeah, because of the bigger aperture of that telescope. Right? So some of the Kepler discoveries that we've made at Gemini include one of the most heralded of the uh, Earth-like planets uh, discovered by Kepler, which is Kepler 437. Uh, and we were the group that established that there was, in fact, a stellar companion in that system as well. This plot is a comparison between speckle imaging with our camera, with the DC camera, and other uh, high resolution imagers at different telescopes. So you can read off the list of the instruments here. There are a couple of CAC instruments. Uh, you may know about the RoboAO uh, telescope at Kitt Peak. The 2.1 meter was converted into a robotic telescope that. Uh, did adaptive optics and search for companions. And a typical detection limit plot for each of these instruments is shown here together with some uh, discoveries that were known at the time and published in Crossfield at all in 2016. The thing to notice is that speckle, although it's a much older technique than adaptive optics, it actually is highly competitive with these others at large apertures. And again, this is why our instrument was on Gemini for six years. So that is a little bit of a history lesson. Um, the DISI instrument is no longer at Gemini. The reason is because uh, one of my uh, collaborators, Steve Howell from NASA Ames, he uh, got the money from NASA to, to build two um, copies of the DC instrument and have them per permanently mounted on Gemini. So Gemini, both Gemini telescopes now have their own speckle capability at all times. So there's no need for the original camera to be there. And so after 2018, we moved that camera to Lowell Observatory for a few years. Uh, until actually just earlier this year. And it was then replaced by a four channel speckle energy camera at Lowell that was built by my collaborator, Gerard Mandel. So we went searching for yet another home for this well traveled instrument, this seat, and it is now at the Apache Point Observatory, three and a half meter, which is in New Mexico, in the southwest of the US. And it's been installed there and used once. So the kinds of things that we're interested in now with that instrument are to do the most complete survey of K dwarfs that's ever been done. So uh, my collaborator, Todd Henry, has a list of 5,000 K dwarfs within 50 parsecs of the sun. We want to do speckle imaging on every single one of those and develop the definitive list of which have companions and which don't. You may know that in exoplanet work, K stars represent a kind of sweet spot for uh, learning about exoplanets. The reason is because K stars are only a little bit less massive than the sun, and they have many properties which are similar to the sun. Um, and so, uh, and yet they are much brighter than M dwarfs and much easier to observe, especially in survey capacity. So we're doing that with an eye towards producing a list of K dwarfs that do not have companions uh, that will be followed up on by various exoplanet missions. We also have other smaller projects, including looking at metal core binaries and characterizing details of the mass luminosity relation. And of course, uh, given the outstanding astrometry that we can get using this technique, we can do high precision orbits of close binary stars, including. Uh, some of the systems we've discovered over the years. So just to show you a couple of results of these case pain wars, um, these are results from Lowell Observatory. These are new discoveries of K dwarfs that have companions. And I show below the distance to each one of these systems and the projected separation of the companions. 
table. So this is 10 AU, this is 6 AU here. So we're really looking at things with our image reconstructions, which are on the same scale as the solar system itself. And so the idea is that if you have a star at 6 AU, away from your primary star, you probably don't have a planet right now, right? So uh, uh, this is helpful information uh, when doing the statistics of exoplanets. As I mentioned, we recently moved the original DISI instrument over to the Apache Point three and a half meter telescope. And so uh, reconstructed image we got on our first run, a new discovery was this system on the right. And uh, the 10 AU bar is shown here in the left part of that image. So you can notice one thing, actually, that as we've been going through looking at these cave dwarfs, we've been looking at them from closer distances out to farther distances because 10 AU is a smaller part of this than it was on the previous frame. Yeah. And so we're working our way out to uh, the limit of the survey, which is. Uh, 50 AU, sorry, 50 parsecs away from the So this is a, an ongoing collaboration with the University of Virginia and the Recons group led by Todd Henry at Georgia State University. All right. Um, a quick fun addendum is that in the course of doing all of the spectral imaging that I've described, we've also looked for ways to extend the spectral imaging technique to uh, regimes where it hasn't previously been used. Usually, when you think of speckle, you think of a very small field of view, maybe two, three arc seconds across, and you try to do the best job of reconstructing the image in that uh, small patch of sky. But if you wanted to look at an object that was you know, tens of arc seconds across, then um, speckle is, has generally not been used because I mentioned that it was a deconvolution technique. And as you move away from the central object you're interested in, then the light from the object is no longer coming down through the same column of, it, of air and the deconvolution, the, the idea that you have the same point spread function instantaneously breaks down. And so um, nonetheless, we have developed some algorithms over the last few years, which allow us to do higher resolution imaging than you would get with the seeing limit, but not quite diffraction of the image. And so this was a fun test we did on Saturn, showing that with this technique, we could get a bit better resolution. So this was a, at a seeing of about 0.8 arc seconds, which is not bad, pretty good. And then this image has a resolution of about 0.2 arc seconds. So not diffraction limited, but a, definitely a, a good improvement over the entire field. And then uh, at Gemini, we did a similar test with Jupiter. Uh, and this image actually was in the magazine Physics Today. So that was back in 2018. And um, this image has the typical great seeing that you get at the Gemini North, which is about 0.6 arc seconds. And over here, again, that's more like 0.15 or 0.2 arc seconds. So improving the resolution by about a factor of three. And then finally, we've used the same technique to look at crowded star fields like um, 30 Uranus. Uh, in the Southern Hemisphere, and this is a space telescope image of the center of that star forming region. And then this is the wide field speckle image that uh, my collaborator, uh, Venu Kalari, has put into the, the paper we submitted a couple of months ago. And in this image, because it's, uh, this is a, this is an uh, HST at 555 nanometers. This is a ground-based image at 832 nanometers, so a little redder, but and of course, much smaller aperture here, but diffraction limited. And then over here, not quite diffraction limited, but better than HST, uh, doing that from the ground. So, uh, so there is a, an avenue, of a road in which we could um, contribute 
wide field spectral imaging to what people know about clusters, although that's not our main thrust. That brings us to the end of chapter one. So now let us ask the question, as good as spectral imaging is, what are its deficiencies? Well, even though it gives you high resolution, you would want better resolution. We all want better resolution. And so uh, one way that you can think about doing that is by uh, doing long baseline optical spectrometry. Another problem that Speckle has is that you throw away a lot of the light. In order to get a good high contrast Speckle image that you can work with that deconvolve, you need to use a narrow band pass. And therefore, you might have two channels like the instrument I've described, but you're still throwing away most of the light. And we would rather not do that. So I'd like to kind of address those two problems in these uh, next two parts of the talk. So briefly, to address this problem of resolution, um, there are various long baseline optical interferometers in the world now today. Uh, a couple of the more famous ones include the Chara Array at Mount Wilson in California. Uh, there's another major one that's near completion in New Mexico at Magdalena Ridge. Uh, there's, of course, DLTI. Uh, and um, there have been a couple over the years in Australia. But most of those are what we would call Michelson-style interferometers. That is, they take the light from various apertures, and they bring that together, and they physically interfere that light, and they observe the interference pattern. And in order to do that, they have to have a very highly controlled, um, uh, they have to highly control the distance uh, between the various apertures and compensate for that in order to see the interference. However, you may know that as far back as the 1950s, uh, Robert Henry Brown and Richard Twiss, two British astronomers, they, uh, had the idea that uh, in addition to physically interfering the light the way Michelson would have back in his day, uh, it was also possible to use the fact that there were intensity correlations uh, in, in uh, light that was due to the fact that light uh, follows Bose-Einstein statistics. And so this rather unusual way of doing interferometry called intensity interferometry began in the 1950s Henry Brown and his collaborators made it, um, an instrument, uh, a two telescope instrument that they installed in Australia. And they used that in the 1960s and 70s to measure the diameters of a couple dozen stars from the Southern Hemisphere. But that technique basically died away because people learned how to control uh, optics well enough to produce uh, Michelson fringes uh, in the way that is most typical now with the Chara Array and these other big interferometers that I've talked about. Nonetheless, in the last 10 or 15 years, people have talked about going back to intensity interferometry. And the main reason why is because today we have off the shelf photon counting detectors that are incredibly fast compared with, you know, 30 or 40 years ago when. Henry Brown was doing his work in Australia. So what we have done at my university is build a three-station intensity interferometer. Each station consists of a 60-centimeter telescope. And then at the focal plane of that telescope is a, a single pixel, uh, single photon avalanche diode detector. And so these detectors are amazing. Things. They record a pulse so quickly that if you have the right timing module, you can timestamp the photon down to about 50 picoseconds. Yeah. And so with that sort of timing precision, something that could only have been dreamed about 40 years ago, it turns out that you can get higher signal to noise in using this technique than uh, Henry Brown could with the technology of the 1970s. And that's why we started to get into this. And there are other groups who've done that as well. There's a group at Nice in France that has built a similar instrument. And there's another one in Italy. Uh, 
So there are about five of these now in the world. So obviously, if you build a long baseline optical interferometer, you can have higher resolution. That's the whole point, right? Uh, the, these telescopes, you separate them by larger and larger distances, and you get better and better resolution as a result of that. But the way that that could influence what we know about exoplanets would have to take something much, much larger than what we can, what we see today with uh, the Chara array and these other existing long baseline optical interferometers. What we might want to do with the exoplanet uh, field is we might want to image the disk of a star and then watch an exoplanet transit occur across it, just the way we would watch Venus transit the sun for example, but that would take exquisite resolution to do that. And it turns out that you would need to build an interferometer, an optical interferometer that is about 20 kilometers in size, okay? You will not do that by bringing light together and letting it physically interfere because the coherence of that light will not be high enough to uh, result in fringes at that point. And so you have to have another technique and this could be it. And so that's one of the reasons that we thought we would build it and see what it could do. The physics of this is fascinating. I'll try to keep this short because this is mainly an astronomy talk, but since uh, photons are bosons, uh, there is a phenomenon called photon bunching. And so if you look at a stream of photons in time, it turns out that the, uh, the expectation value for uh, as a function of time is not flat, but it varies in time. So this means that if you had two such streams and you cross-correlated them, you would get intensity correlations. This is what uh, Twist realized back in the 1950s. And so um, these bunching, this, this phenomenon of bunching happens over a characteristic time scale which is usually written tau naught. And that time scale is determined by the frequency bandwidth of the light that you're going to use. What that generally means is to see this fluctuation, you must use an incredibly narrow filter. Yeah? And so that's why in normal astronomy, we don't see anything like this. We cannot see that because uh, if you use a normal wider filter, these fluctuations decrease in size and essentially they wash out. But if you use a very narrow filter, then you can begin to see this effect. And that is essentially what we've been able to, to do. Uh, according to the theory, um, if you have a perfect detector, then as I say, if you have two identical streams of photons and you cross correlate them, then and you normalize that function, then this photon bunching should give you an extra additive term onto the uh, whatever the average value of correlations that you would get from Gauss statistics. And so in the case of an object which is unresolved, this whole term here would have a maximum value of one. You should see a peak above uh, the pedestal of uh, random correlations, which is as high as the pedestal itself. However, it's not that easy because if you calculate the width of tau naught here, that turns out to be fractal, at most sort of a fraction of a picosecond. And even with the uh, detectors that we have today, uh, they can read out at about 50 picoseconds. Hmm. And so that's a factor of at least 50, maybe 100. So what you're saying is you've got about 50 or 100 of these peaks in intensity in one timing bit for the instrument. Yeah, and so what that does is it says that if I detect a photon here and I detect another photon in the next, uh, you know, um, intensity uh, peak over here, these aren't due. These will wind up in the same timing bin of my detector, but they won't be correlated through photon bunching. They are uh, they are part of the random correlation that you get. Uh, that, and the reason is because you have so many of these peaks inside one timing interval. So it, the way that works out is that the second term gets knocked down by a factor of tau naught over your detector speed. Yeah. 
And so this also tells us that even if you use a very narrow band pass filter and you use a very fast detector, at most you'll have a factor of a few percent in this second term once you multiply by this, uh, the chance of a true correlation. And so it's a, it's a hard thing to measure, but it's worth trying uh, if we can make long baseline optical interferometers, which are larger. This slide, I don't think I need to talk too much about. This is mainly just saying that we built our instrument and we are detecting photons uh, at close to the rate that we expect to be there. So we're not losing a heck of a lot of light. We still have some work to do to make our system more efficient, but we're within a factor of two of collecting all the photons we have to collect using our instrument. And so we're in a good position to see whether we can measure photon correlation. Uh, as usual, as you would expect, we've done simulations uh, before we went out and bought this all the instrumentation and we put it together. And so our simulation suggests that, okay, we should see this correlation at a level of a few percent uh, above the large constant uh, pedestal of photon correlations between any two channels. And so I'm going to subtract away this pedestal in the real data that I show you next. But this is real data now with the real instrument. And, you know, uh, at where we expect that uh, overproduction of correlations to exist due to photon bunching, we are seeing an excess of counts. And we've analyzed the data in a couple of different ways. Uh, and I, we think we understand some of the difficulties of positioning our telescopes in a repeatable way. But the bottom line is that when you get everything just right, you can see a correlation. Uh, you can see excess correlation that you subtract away the, the very, very large pedestal of uh, random correlations. Actually, that you probably can't read this, but it's 3 million correlations were subtracted off of here. And what we see here is about 10,000 correlations. So that means that our instrument can see these, these excess correlations at a level of about 0.3%. Hard measurement to make. Nonetheless, it's there. And when we uh, look at various stars and we change our baseline accordingly, then um, as we move out to the point where the separation between the telescopes is big enough, that um, the star we're looking at will be resolved, then this correlation disappears. Because no longer are we looking at the same photon stream, but we're looking at um, uh, statistically different photon streams. And so you can use this to develop your visibility curve, which we've done for a couple of bright stars here. And you can uh, start to measure stellar diameter. So that's kind of the, the level that we can do this work at. But I wanted to tell you about this because of the dream of seeing an exoplanet transit, you know, uh, across its host star. So our campus, our university campus is about a kilometer in diameter. So what we're doing now is we're getting ready to put the telescopes at the corners of our campus. And we obviously cannot string cable between the telescopes for that length. But what we can do is we can outfit each telescope with a GPS and we can get a, uh, a basic tick of the clock from GPS signals. And so that's what we're attempting to do now. And we're, we've been studying that situation in the lab. When you go with GPS signals, because the timing uh, is not as precise as the timing module that we actually use for the experiment, you lose you basically spread out your correlation. And so uh, right now, our instrument with the size telescopes we have, uh, we could probably only look at Sirius, the, the brightest star in the sky, and be able to see uh, a correlation if we're in wireless mode. Uh, if you do string wires, as we did for the data that I showed you a slide ago, then the correlations really are confined in time because the tick of the clock is the same. It's the same time correlator you can use it to time stamp every photon. Every Nonetheless, this is an exciting prospect, I think, 
to cut the cord to make optical interferometry wireless. And if you can do that, then you could take these telescopes and spread them out by 10 kilometers, maybe five kilometers, 10 kilometers, 15 kilometers. Then you get up to the size where you could actually not only image a star, but image the planet coming across the star. And so <clears throat> even on our campus, if you separate the telescopes by a kilometer and you looked at the sun at a distance of 10 parsecs away, it would have this particular size and then the resolution of our instrument would be this dot here. So imagine that we have about six or eight resolution elements across a star like the sun. So yeah, you might be able to see a super Jupiter if you could get all the data fast enough and you had an instrument that was sensitive enough, you might be able to see something the size of this crossing the size of that. And that is what we would ultimately like to prove that we could do with an instrument like the prototype. One reason to think this is possible is because although we have used single pixel uh, SPAD devices, uh, you know, Canon and other manufacturers are making SPAD arrays. So essentially you can take all the starlight and you can spread it across many pixels. You could even take your starlight and use a grating and spread out the light into different, slightly different wavelengths and then do many different intensity interferometry experiments at different wavelengths simultaneously with the same telescopes. So this is a way to make these kinds of systems much more efficient. Right now in our lab, we have uh, one SPAD array. It's only eight pixels, but we bought it from uh, Politecnico de Milano uh, when they were done using that, that instrument themselves. So here's a mock-up of the optics that you would need to use that SPAD array and to detect eight different wavelengths simultaneously. Basically, light from the telescope comes in here, it's collimated, there's a reflected grating, normal mirror, a re-imaging lens, and then you get eight different wavelengths on the eight different pixels here. If we could do that on all three telescopes, we could get a factor of the square root of eight in signal to noise, because we're doing eight different independent experiments at slightly different wavelengths. That's what we would like to do to improve our instrument next. Okay. Finally, chapter three is another kind of, well, uh, working our way back to speckle imaging. And it's another kind of exercise in dreaming a little bit. Um, it's a, an instrument concept, something we would like to build in the coming years at my university with collaborators <coughs> uh, at other places in the US. So here's the idea. I mentioned a few minutes ago that one problem with speckle imaging is that you throw a lot of light away. Don't do that in astronomy. That's not a good thing to do. Well, how can you retain all of the light and have it in a form where you can use it for speckle imaging? Because you also need the narrow wavelength band to make uh, high contrast speckle patterns that show you the speckles in, in uh, as much detail as you can. The answer is you would want to use an integral field unit. So an integral field unit is uh, a fiber bundle that flares out into ribbons that you can then feed into a spectrograph. Therefore, every point on the input face of the fiber bundle ultimately produces a spectrum on some camera, okay? And if these cameras can read out at a fast rate, which I think we were talking earlier about how, how much you can buy, how, what great uh, speed you can get in uh, large format cameras these days. Yes, you can imagine a system where every input fiber gives you a spectrum, and then you have all the color information You've got all of the light in the visible recorded from every point of the image. And so this is a large and complex instrument that I'm proposing. This input face for a speckle camera would have to have thousands of fibers. That is difficult to do. 
but uh, there are places in the, uh, in the US where they have mastered this art of building integral field units. And so I propose that we build one for us as the input of, for a speckle camera. So um, if we get funded by the National Science Foundation, we will build this instrument. So we are, we are not at that point yet, but what I can show you are some of the simulated data that I have made in preparation for building this instrument. So this is an example of one of four large cameras that would record spec the, the spectra probably uh, 20 or 30 times a second. So it's gonna produce a large, large quantity of data. And so each spectrum that you see here is grouped in, uh, I think it's 22 in this simulation. So you have a group of 22, the next group of 22 and so on and so forth. And each one of these spectra goes back to an original input fiber. Yeah. And so what one needs to know is the mapping of where is the spectrum, where was it in the original input phase? Yeah. But if you have all that and you can do that reverse mapping, you can say, okay, well, this pixel right there, that is 650 nanometers at this particular place on the input. And so if you have that mapping and you go back and you reconstruct speckle patterns at whatever wavelength you want, you can see that in this simulation, basically, uh, you know, at bluer wavelengths, we get um, more speckles and at redder wavelengths, we get fewer but fatter speckles, which is the way it should be. That is uh, what theory tells us should happen. So this is, uh, the sort of simulated data that we get from this operation. And I would make the claim that this has several important advantages for uh, doing speckle imaging, high resolution imaging, and for therefore for exoplanet. One thing is that with speckle imaging, you have to choose the wavelength uh, width in advance. So what do you do? You guess, you say, okay, my seeing sight is normally, I get this kind of seeing, maybe it's 0.8 arc seconds. That's my typical seeing. Therefore, I'm gonna use a wavelength band pass that's 30 nanometers wide. Yeah? If you had worse seeing, you'd need to use a narrower band pass to get the same sort of spectral contrast. With this system, you can always choose the correct wavelength uh, band pass in order to get the highest signal to noise ratio. If you're seeing is worse, then you're going to use fewer uh, fewer of these wavelength uh, bins. If it's better, you would have the chance to use more of them. And this shows this plot basically shows that um, that you can reconstruct up to the speckled noise limit the, the theoretical signal to noise you're supposed to get as long as you pick the right number. But you always can pick it, right now. So that's one advantage. You always maximize your signal to noise. The other thing is if we are taking spectra of speckles, then in essence, we have all the information we need to get spectra of the components of a binary star system with every observation. If I want the composite spectrum of the entire object, I would just sum up all of the spectra that I got all over the image plane. So I definitely had, I could record that. At the same time, I can take each one of my speckle wavelength intervals. I can do a typical speckle image reconstruction and I can get the flux ratio as a function of wavelength from that. And then from these two, I can work out what the individual primary and secondary star spec spectra look like. So I can do spectral typing with every observation that I do. And um, from these two plots, I show you the quality of reconstructed image we get in the simulation, these are actually diffraction limited. Diffraction limited at, at all of these wavelengths across there. So even when the two stars are very, very close together, you get the spectral types of both. Great. And then almost for free, uh, you can do another trick for image reconstruction. You can use a technique called analytic continuation. Basically, analytic continuation says, if you know the Fourier components of your object within a radius of the origin, and you know certain properties of that function, 
um, then you can extrapolate uniquely out to higher frequencies. And so uh, that technique is something that I used on the simulated data. And generally speaking, at least in my experience, analytic continuation does give you higher resolution, but it comes at a price. And that price is a lot of ringing on the final image, right? So you see a lot of uh, rings around the stars in this image. But if you want to add together all of the analytic, analytically continued images at all wavelengths, you essentially wash out all of those features and what's left are the stars. So this is a super diffraction limited image, or I guess I should say sub diffraction limited image, better than the diffraction limit, which is achieved by this process of unique continuation of the Fourier components. Uh, so this is uh, another reason this camera could be much more powerful than uh, just collecting all the light. You can take all that light and do interesting things with it. And then the final thought to leave you with on this idea is back to exoplanets. A couple of years ago, there was a paper uh, written by Steve Powell. I was one of the co-authors where we looked at one of the brightest um, Kepler discoveries, it's Kepler-13. Kepler-13 is a binary that's separated by about an arc second. And one of those two stars has a Jupiter-sized planet going around it, okay? But which of those two stars? How are you going to know, right? So if you go through the analysis that I kind of suggested here, you um, looked at that, uh, looked at the uh, magnitude difference of the two stars as the system goes into transit and then comes out of transit, and you do it with um, the speckle camera that I described in the beginning at one of the largest telescopes in the world, you get data which is very ratty. Okay, And the reason is because, again, it's back to these same problems, speckle, you're throwing away a lot of the light, you've got an eight meter telescope, but you're only using a fraction of that in terms of the light that you collect and analyze. And so what we see is, and the other thing that we see is that the, the, the results we get moment by moment from the magnitude difference, those are affected by our deconvolution, the quality of the deconvolution. So the seeing may change a little bit from moment to moment or minute to minute, and what happens is we get a different uh, magnitude difference uh, as a result. You can average groups of observations. You can get a slightly better result. You can, if you know when the eclipse or the transit happens, you can say, okay, well, this is out of transit. This is in transit. This is out of transit. And if you do all of that, you can just barely, barely see that when Kepler-13 goes into transit, that the magnitude difference goes down. And that means that that planet orbits the primary star. Yeah. But who wants to deal with the data that's this bad? You know, and what's your chance of looking at, you know, stars you really care about? About It's about zero squared, right? But if you use all of the light, if you were to build this diffusive instrument and use every wavelength and you combine all of that information because there's nothing color dependent about this plot, Right? You can do it panchromatically, and then you would get this. But I think you'd agree that you can see the transit in this case, and you can establish in a single observation with the QC which of the two stars the planet actually orbits. And so this is uh, a main motivation for building the QC instrument if we get the money to do that. Okay, so just to briefly uh, summarize. Um, at Southern Connecticut State University, we have a strong uh, program in spectral imaging and instrumentation development. The science that we're doing right now is mainly on K dwarfs. We're kind of coming to the end of the end dwarfs, which is why I didn't really talk about that too much. And we're using the original spectral instrument BISI, but there are several others that I helped build in. Uh, I continue to get data from and my students continue to use. And then uh, on the spectral imaging side, our uh, next big project that we hope to do is to combine an IFU with a spectral imager 
to use every single photon at every wavelength um, and do it in a way where we can do high resolution imaging. And then we also have the uh, intensity interferometer, which I briefly described. Right now, we're at the stage of measuring stellar diameters from our campus with 60 centimeter telescopes. But our next steps include making that a wireless system, increasing the baseline, and increasing the efficiency through using SPAD arrays instead of single pixel detectors. So if you know of any undergraduates who would like an international experience, we have a master's program at my university where uh, you can do astronomical instrumentation, but we're also very strong in material science and nanotechnology. And we would welcome applications from folks from Catalonia. Thank you very much. Okay, so questions are welcome, either from here or from the Zoom. Mark? Yes, first question was on this roadway. Do you have funding for these applications or how does it work? Because sometimes students uh, ask that. Right now, we have a significant amount of funding and we need students. Okay. In two years' time, who knows, right? Uh, but but at the moment, point. things are, we are, we need students more than money. <laughs> okay, good. And second question, regarding uh, intensity and astronomy, uh, during the last year, there has been an effort in the, in the community uh, that is working in very high energy gamma rays. Yeah. And uh, particularly in the US, there is the Veritas experiment. And they have worked on uh, installing a in intensity interferometer system right. there. Yeah. And they are, they are working on that. And there are also efforts uh, here in, in La Palma, in Spain, with the magic telescopes. Right. And uh, there is an ongoing effort to uh, convince the community that this would be good to have it also in the strength of telescope array. Yeah. Right. And so on. Right. And yeah, I just want to. Right. I, I didn't know if you were aware or not. That's, I yes. Think, there is an ongoing effort there. And it's good. No, I think that's a great point. And I didn't mention Veritas and um, Magic only because those are sort of a different flavor of intensity interferometer because the telescopes they use, of course, for Shrenkov detection, they're very large, right? But they don't have very good optical quality. And so essentially, when all that light comes to a focus, they need a big detector. And so they use photomultiplier tubes. Yeah. Right, that is a that is a kind of a different regime from what I described with SPAD detectors, small telescopes, and very good image quality. Right, so but but you're right that I think the high energy community they uh, have their own reasons for pursuing this. Essentially, they can do Shrenkov detection when the moon is down, but they need a science project when the moon is up, and intensity interferometry fills a good niche for them. And those instruments generally will be more powerful than what I described, only because they have such large mirrors, right, to, to work with. Well, they, they are playing a lot now because uh, since you can uh, move the, the mirrors in, in different ways, yeah, you can produce different patterns in the mirrors, and you can play with the baselines much as you like, right? So yeah, uh, they, they, you can have baselines within the same telescope, right? And you can make a baseline with different telescopes and different groupings. So yeah. It's, uh, well, it's, it's very nice what they are willing to do in the following year. It's, yeah. Uh, I, some I really think that, you know, like um, there's a lot of potential for very large baselines in the optical with this technique. Yeah. And, uh, there are these two different ways to, to approach it, but both are valuable. Final question. I was astonished. I mean, if you have this this precision with GPS of let's say microseconds and so on, how are you able to still recover? I mean, you have a dispersion of the signal and so on, but yeah, you are still able to, to, to do it. That's, yes, that's amazing. Yeah, we've proven that in the lab. Basically, what we did was we took a single detector, we split the signal, and then we feed it into two different timing correlators that are controlled with two different GPSs. Those GPSs, they, every second, they, they insert a data word into the data stream, but we 
we know in advance that it's the same group of photons. So we can tell, you know, how well the tick of the clock is working. That's what's really helped us. Um, so that, and, and I think there's more room to do. Basically, um, if we had a more sophisticated algorithm, I think we can get better precision than what I quoted, you know, maybe by a factor of two. So maybe we can squeeze that distribution down a little bit. And therefore, the more you squeeze it down, then the fainter you can go. What? First, I have a lot of, lot of questions. But <laughs> um, I was wondering if any of those techniques could be um, improved to such a point in which uh, we could be able to detect uh, non transiting exoplanets directly, not for very close um, uh, exoplanets, I mean, not. I mean, I haven't thought about that. That is a very hard problem because of the large difference in brightness. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I think. But I mean, if you had a, let's say, a hot Jupiter, it's, it's large, relatively large, and you will have some emissions from that. Right. But you'd want to go to the infrared, right? Which is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and therefore, I think Speckle. The, the niche that Speckle has is that it's in the visible, so you get a better resolution. But what you give up is any infrared signature. If you want to do that, then there are uh, yeah. adaptive optics coronagraphs that'll do that. Yeah. Um, I also have a lot of questions, but uh, since you will be here, I would, <laughs> but I mean, I'm, I'm I'm astonished with the with the interest, with the with the intensity uh, interferometry. Let's say uh, the wireless part, which I understand that you have in the below. Or well, only we tested process. in the lab, right? Yeah. We have not done that on the sky. Yeah. Is five G? Um. Well, I mean, yeah. these. I guess. I'm not sure that really applies to the timing signature, right? Whatever that is, you know, the generation. Basically, what you do is you buy the best timing card you can, mm -hmm. and uh, an antenna which will find a group of satellites that are up there. So I'm not. I don't think it's like cellular where you are plugged into that. Mm -hmm. and so then, and yeah. every year, you know, like somebody will produce a better okay. GPS timing card, and, and I think that's one of the reasons also for some hope here. And then another topic that I'm sure that I will have addressed is the real time operating system that builds the whole thing because it must be real time. At well, so, per second, right. it must be super real time. Right. So we have these correlators that are we bought from PicoQuant, which is a German company, I think. Okay. Uh -huh. And uh, essentially, they have a proprietary way uh -huh. to get. Uh, very, very precise timing information on each incoming event. Oh, wow. And so uh, the, uh, the end result is that the timing correlators, depending on how much money you have, okay. they can, you can buy a timing correlator that will go down to supposedly a one picosecond uh, precision timer. We don't, we have one of those that cost quite a lot of money. And then we have three more that are less precise than that but lower cost. Mm -hmm. But PicoQuant has made these, not for astronomy, but they made it for uh, mm -hmm. biology basically because uh, if there are bioluminescent signals which are very precisely defined by a timing gap between when you stimulate the sample and when that comes back. So uh, if the return signal, uh, the Biologists who study that need a very, very precise timing signal uh, to work with in order to establish what the chemistry of that sample is. And so that's why these devices were built. And happily, astronomers, like we often do, can piggyback on somebody else's uh, new technology. Anybody yeah. uh, Sorry, I'm not checking. Nobody. No. Okay. okay. So 
Thank you for the excellent talk and Thank <laughs> you.